Okay, so again, in light of what happened on, I think it was Tuesday, when those events unfolded in Uvalde, Texas, in light of that, I, I just keep thinking about one in God's providence, we're in Romans 8, which talks about the suffering of us as Christians, the suffering and groaning of creation, and then how God sympathizes with our suffering and how he has mercy on us and our suffering. And so I keep thinking about those things, and I want to start with Romans 8. I'm going to read the section that we're going to be in actually in the sermon. We're not going to park in Romans 8 in Sunday school, but I do want to just start with that. And that will make sense of my little drawing on the board here as well. And I'm going to read verses 22 through 27. It says, For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but we ourselves also, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. In the same way, the Spirit helps our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, and he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. In this passage, three times the word groaning comes up, and our sermon is going to be framed around the, the uses of the word groaning in this passage. There's three occurrences. One, it speaks of groaning with respect to, to creation. Creation is groaning. And then it talks about we ourselves groaning. So here we are as, as creatures, limited creatures within creation, and we are groaning. And then, lastly, it refers to God's Spirit. So I'm just going to say the Holy Spirit given to us. He's within us, and, and He is groaning also. One of the things that happened as I, as I watched news clips online regarding what took place in, in Texas, there was one clip where they featured the, the vigil. They had a vigil there, and, and so there are all these parents in the community, of course, just families, tons of people, and you're hearing you're hearing people groaning loudly and wailing loudly. And that's coming from, of course, this deep, deep, profound grief that they're experiencing. Some of them maybe lost loved ones, lost a child, or, or one of the adults that was killed. Others just being in that, in that location, proximity, close to what happened, overwhelmed by grief. And, and you hear the audible sounds of people, their suffering coming out of them, right? And so, again, in God's province, I'm in Romans 8, and this idea of groaning comes up over and over. And, and on these three levels, and I, I think contextually what Paul is talking about is the groaning of the fallen world and in all aspects of that, to include tragedies like took place last week. It's interesting that you have creation itself groaning, then you have we ourselves groaning, and then this idea that the Spirit is groaning, which speaks of God's willingness to, to enter into our grief that he is, he is above it. In one sense, you could say it, it takes place. I mean, you really, you really kind of have to conclude it takes place because of him in a sense. I mean, he created the world. He, he had a plan even for the fall and the curse. He's the one who engineered things such that there would be a curse that plays out in the way it plays out. And, and then things happen. Over all of human history, Human history has been said by historians, it's basically a conveyor belt of death. I mean, it's like one after another of these types of events that take place in this fallen world. And so God is over it. God planned it. God is in control of it. And God enters into it. That's what's particularly encouraging about this arrow. It's like, God, he's not aloof. He's not way up there detached, but enters into it. And in the, in the sermon, I'll go into even some other places that speak of his mercy on our suffering. But for starters, just the concept itself that he is, he's, not, he's not separate from it, that he's within it, it is itself encouraging. Now, with that kind of framing things, turn to Job, if you're not already there, turn to Job. And we're going to look at some passages in, in Job 
because of what he went through that in some sense is similar. I mean, he lost his kids. So we're going we're gonna to look at that. But before we do, you tell me, tell me what, what types of questions have you had in your mind as you heard about what happened? Have questions come up in your mind at all? And if so, what, what types of questions? And it, it could be anything. Don't, don't think I'm looking for something specific here. But what, would, what in your experience, in your real interpretation of what took place, what types of questions did you have? You wonder what would bring a kid that age to that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, what would bring the shooter to, to that place, right? What would possess him in such a way that he would commit such an atrocious act? Yeah, and wasn't he just 18? Uh, yeah, I think so, right around there. I had questions about how there's so many different perspectives of yeah. what happened yeah. across the board. Mm -hmm. Still a lot of mystery. There's this debate about did the police wait too long? Why did they wait so long? I mean, most people say they waited too long, but why did they wait so long? And then there's a story that came out even this morning. I saw a little something on Facebook about this um, hero, uh, off duty. He just get his hair cut. I forget if he was, I think it was Border Patrol or one of those agents, and uh, getting his hair cut. He gets a text from his wife, who is, I think, a teacher in the school, I believe. And then he went there, and it's possible that he is the one that took down the gunman. Uh, and and I, again, that's that's. A story right now but to your point Larry it's kind of like over time we'll, we'll learn the truth as more and more facts come in and they have to sit through and figure out okay what exactly happened but there's lots of questions regarding I was saying, I was saying more of why people have people land very quickly about why it happened you know, right we, we, right as Christians we tend to say you know, evil yeah and other people yeah and if you're you know in touch with your humanity at all and you put yourself in the shoes of those parents and look, I dropped Jocelyn off at the bus stop the next day. It was a different experience for me than it usually is. I mean, I was thinking more about, gosh, it is kind of scary. You just send your kid off. Usually, you know, day by day, you do that, you don't even think about it. And then all of a sudden, now you're thinking about it. And you're, even though you know that, okay, it's still an isolated type of event, but it makes you think. And so all these questions about, you know, why, why would he do such a thing? Why, why did it take so long to, to put an end to it? You know, who, who stepped up, who didn't, who was negligent, who didn't do their job, who was crippled and paralyzed by fear, or were they paralyzed by protocol of some other kind, or what was it? Uh, family members of the, the gunmen, you could wonder why in the world they didn't intervene sooner. They obviously knew that this kid had problems. Why didn't they do something? Or did they do something, but why didn't they do more? I mean. You could go on and on, really, forever asking these types of questions. I thought of this this phenomenon, which we, we highlight around here often because of our love for the truth. One, okay, the truth of Scripture, which is rock solid. Now, our, our interpretation of that can be different, but, but it by itself, objectively, is solid, right, and, and reliable. But then there's the issue of just human opinions and perceptions. And so even as, even as the more, as information comes out, there's interpretation of that. There's all sorts of reasons people interpret it certain ways. And it's difficult to get to what is the truth, accurate with 100% accuracy, because there are so many skewed perspectives and and so on. And to your point, so yeah, so even to think of, okay, the mom says something, which on one level, I'd heard that, but to hear her crying out for forgiveness is interesting, because it's like, well, are people apt to do that? I mean, some people, maybe, but a lot of people probably be like, God, no, <laughs> sorry, no forgiveness for you because this was your kid and he's messed up because you're messed up and you should have done something sooner. Uh, whatever. I don't know. I, I just imagine people in all different directions with that. But this is why, you know, when you have the, in the fray of human back and forth, there are all these limited perspectives and we're all driven by our own what we talk about, we have been since the beginning of Romans, our own, not only our desires and what we would want, 
which some level is healthy, like wanting these things not to happen, but also on another level, like wanting more than what is, like not accepting what is. And then there's this other issue of judgments, like the issuing of judgments and how we all, you know, want to point that finger because that takes the focus off of us and any accountability for our own contribution to the evils of this world. We don't want to think about that. We want to, we want to play armchair quarterback. We want to sit in judgment. And that's exactly what happens. And man, it just blows up all over social media and all the forums now where people can put their two cents in there. That's what you see over and over and over again. And uh, some of that I'll give an example in, uh, in the sermon. But even one, I've got one in my Sunday school notes here where someone shared, it's a friend of mine who's, who's, I think he would say a full-blown atheist. I don't think he's even agnostic. I think you'd say he's full-blown atheist, but he has this little cartoon and this one, there's two people side by side, and, and the woman says, why didn't God stop the shooting? And then the, the guy next to her says, because God doesn't exist, engage with reality and fix your gun laws. So... And from this perspective of this friend of mine, it's like, well, hey, what, do you need more evidence that God doesn't exist? Because if he existed, how the heck do you account for it? He doesn't exist. Shut up with your stupid prayers and thoughts and all that stuff and fix the gun laws. Because if we fix the gun laws, then these things won't happen anymore. Well, that's not really helpful either because you could, you could, you could literally incinerate every weapon on the earth and still humans would find ways to kill each other because it's in the human heart, right? And that doesn't mean, by the way, that we shouldn't look at gun laws. And obviously, you, you wouldn't allow an 18-year-old to buy a rocket launcher or to get access to a nuclear weapons uh, detonator. So, okay, yeah, th there's got to be some balance there, granted. But there is this issue of just the human heart. Okay, so uh, I'm starting to go all over the place. All right, so Job, let's just read it. And here, and the reason I even drew the little picture on the board was to was to remember that Job was an, Job was an example of a creature groaning in a fallen, cursed, groaning creation with a God over the whole thing. And there are countless other iterations of Job, including you and me today. We are creatures in creation, groaning, groaning along with creation, with a God over all of that. Okay, Job, let's see, where do we want to start here? Let's start with what happened. So do you remember there's waves of, waves of tragedy that take place in Job? And the... Last wave before Satan requests permission to actually touch Job's body, the last wave of the tragedies was when all of his children were killed. Verse 19, behold, a great wind, um, chapter 1, sorry, chapter 1, verse 19, behold, a great wind came from across the wilderness, struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they died, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground, and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all this, Job did not sin, but nor did he blame God. And in my in my notes in the margin. For blame God, it says you could translate that. Nor did he ascribe unseemliness to God. So what does that mean? What is unseemliness? Nor did Job ascribe unseemliness to God. Bad behavior. Okay. okay, bad behavior, something inappropriate. Nor did he accuse God of doing something wrong. Well, let's start with the with the grief. Again, you take what happened, which is very real and profound and its own form of torture for the, the parents in Valdi, Texas, who lost their, their child. They're going through it right now. Joe went through it. For as a parent and a lot of other parents in here, you, you can't you can't imagine something worse 
saw one of the dads interviewed, and he said, you, you want your kids to attend your funeral, not the opposite. There's not any sane, normal, living, breathing human being who doesn't believe in that, feel that way. Yeah, you, you don't want them to go before you. It, it, it is arguably the worst thing someone can go through in their lives is to lose a child. In Job's case, he lost all of them. It's not a small deal. And he is crushed. And initially, as has been highlighted, as Donna's brought up many times, initially, there is this quietness about him. There is this acceptance. You could say, hey, what would it look like? What would it look like for a parent in Uvalde, Texas, who lost a child to, to lose that child in a quote-unquote righteous way? What would that look like? What would it look like for them to have acceptance? And, and it almost seems crazy to ask the question. And if, again, you're in touch with your humanness and you're aware of yourself and what it would be like for you, you don't even want to ask such a question because it's just, it's going to be what it's going to be. And it's going to be a, a crazy mix, even for someone who believes in God, who may on some level be able to say with Job here, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. There is still a grief and a pain that goes deeper and, and like can't even be measured, right? Immeasurable grief. And so it, it is, it'd be way oversimplified to even think of it that way. But if you were to think about what would it look like, well, it kind of look like what you see in Job to have a quote unquote righteous response. And as we've been talking about for weeks and months, even before when Don was in Job, while you do see that initially, and you might be tempted to think, well, here's the example of a, a righteous man. On one level, yes, you have that initial response and a submissiveness and an acceptance. But then over time, you start to see the very thing it says Job did not do initially in verse 22, he begins to do. And it is stunning to me years ago because I have so often heard Job taught in a way that that really elevates Job, that really spotlights Job. But when you look at chapter 2, where finally, you remember the story again, just to remind you of the details. So Satan asked God, okay, fine. you know what? Any man, sure, we took everything away from him, um, but any, every every man out there, basically, he says, has his limits. And if you if you allow me to touch his body, or I think he says to God, if, God, if you touch his body, he'll curse you to your face. So then it's this next level of suffering where now Job, not only is he internally, emotionally tormented, but now his physical body is suffering with these boils that he ends up with. So now he's like leveled, right? And it says in verses 9 and 10, his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Because she's observing his quietness. She's observing him saying things like the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. She's observing his apparent righteousness. And she says, hey, you still hold on to your integrity? Curse God and die. By the way, curse God and die, whether explicitly ever stated by someone living in Uvalde, Texas, grieving right now or not, uh, that is kind of what they're, I would, I would bet you money, are feeling. But Job said to her, you speak as one of the foolish Women speaks, shall we indeed accept good from God and not adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Here again, we see Job, which truly, on a, on a real level, is a manifestation of a, of a submission, of, of a righteousness. But we're going to see that it also has its limits. So you see, okay, in one sense, you see the example. And yet, as a little time goes by, that grief and understandable brokenness gives way to an overwhelming 
frustration, questioning, protest coming from Job. And that's where the language is so important. When it says, in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And then you go down just a few verses. From verse 10 of chapter 2 down to verse 1 of chapter 3. Afterwards, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. The, the word lips is sapa in Hebrew, which I think I'm getting that pronunciation about right. Sapa is the, and, and the, and the word mouth in 3.1 is pa. <laughs> sapa, pa. It's the same root, okay? Same idea. You hear the same sound, right? It's the same idea. Uh, later in Job, it's used as, they call it parallelism. It's a, it's a Hebrew way of, of, of communicating where they would write the same idea twice in one sentence or in this close proximity in Proverbs you see a lot where they'll say the same thing two different ways. And in one of those parallelisms later in Job, it uses the word lips and the word mouth synonymously. It's, it's the same idea, okay? So it's like saying, hey, initially Job didn't sin, he, nothing came out of his mouth, and then three verse one, and then some things came out of his mouth. Initially, chapter one, the end of it says, he did not blame God or ascribe to God any unseemliness. And then chapter 3, verse 1 and following, you see Paul, Job uh, ascribing to God unseemliness. And I'm going to give you some examples of that. And again, the reason I do that, to be hopefully as clear as possible, is not to pig pile on Job and his suffering, just like what people are going through in Valdi, Texas, like this is not a time to be trying to give like little pointers and this is a time to just grieve, weep with those who weep and not throw around just some sentimental ideas or platitudes. Thank you, that's a good word, platitudes. So I'm just saying this is, this is an example of someone going through this type of thing and this is what you see bubbling out of a human being and it would be bubbling out of me and you and everyone else in this world so Joel begins speaking okay in fact where is it? I have it in my notes but later it's interesting another just evidence if, if because there's so because the majority of commentators I've ever read have interpreted this as highlighting Job's righteousness and attributing righteousness to Job and not recognizing all his questioning and statements as accusatory toward God. A lot of them just believe those are expressions of righteousness. I do not. So one more one more piece of evidence of that is later it says Job says, "Hey, I restrained my lips, but I'm not going to do that anymore." Now the bitterness is going to come out, where he literally is like, hey, I was biting my tongue back there. And so even in the beginning of the story, it wasn't like Job wasn't thinking, God, what on earth are you doing? He kind of admits later, well, I was restraining myself, and I'm not going to anymore. Now I'm just going to give full vent to what I'm really thinking. So now you look at, okay, what's he really thinking? And I'll give you some examples, because I just went through... This is just a sampling, there are many others, but just a sampling of the types of things that Job accuses God of. He accuses God of being a bully, of keeping suffering people alive. This is in chapter 3, verses 20 through 26. If you want to jot some of these down, you could you look at them later, but... Basically keeping people alive who are suffering and not allowing them to just finally die. He hedges them in. They're stuck. Verse chapter six, verse four. The arrows of the Almighty are within me. Their poison, they sorry, their poison my spirit drinks. Like God's arrows are within me. And they're not just arrows, they're poison tipped arrows. Chapter 7, verse 1, is not man forced to labor on earth? And are not his days like the days of a hired man as a slave who pants for the shade? And as a hired man who eagerly waits for his wages, basically, God, you make him continue working as a slave. So God's like an abusive slave master. Chapter 7, verse 13 and 15, if I say my bed will comfort me, my couch will ease my complaint, okay, maybe I can just go lie down for a while and get some rest. And what happens? Then you frighten me with dreams and terrify me by visions. 
so that my soul would choose suffocation and death rather than my pain. God, you torture me. Even when I try to rest, I just try to physically rest, I can't even do that because you afflict me with dreams and you torment me and you frighten me. Later in chapter 7, verses 20 and 21. Why have you set me as your target? Why do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now I will lie down in the dust and you will seek me, but I won't be anymore. This is in chapter 9, which is 1 through 13. So I'm summarizing, but basically the idea that God won't restrain his anger. Chapter 9, verses 17 and 18. He bruises me with a tempest and multiplies my wounds without cause. He will not allow me to get my breath, but saturates me with bitterness. Again, it's like the idea of God is a bully. Chapter 9, verse 20 through 22. Though I am righteous, though I am guiltless, he will declare me guilty. It's all one thing, therefore I say, he destroys the guiltless and the wicked alike. So it's okay, okay well, he just, he just destroys everybody. So here I am, the guiltless guy, and there's the wicked over there, and he just sort of, across the board, just destroys everybody, even, even me, <laughs> the guiltless one. There's his perspective. Chapter 13, verse 24. Why do you hide your face and consider me your enemy? God considers Job his enemy, according to Job's perspective. This is what he's believing. And again, if you're in touch with your humanity and you're going through what he's going through, or you're going through in modern occurrences what happened this past week, you get it. Chapter 16, verses 7 through 14. Now he has exhausted me. You have laid waste all my company. You have shriveled me up. My leanness rises up against me and testifies to my face. His anger has torn me and hunted me down. He has gnashed at me with his teeth. My adversary glares at me. They have gaped at me with their mouth. They have slapped me on the cheek with contempt. They have massed themselves against me. So now he's talking about, hey, the way other people are mistreating him, and then watch how he goes back to God. Next verse. God hands me over to ruffians and tosses me into the hands of the wicked. I was at ease, but he shattered me, and he has grasped me by the neck and shaken me to pieces. He has also set me up as his target. His arrows surround me. Without mercy, he splits my kidneys open. He pours out my gall on the ground. He breaks through me with breach after breach. He runs at me like a warrior. That's pretty intense, right? <clears throat> Chapter 19, verse 6, just a few more, I'll stop. But know then that, the, that God has wronged me and has closed his net around me. Same chapter, verses 8 through 11. He was walled up my ways so that I cannot pass. He has put darkness on my paths. He has stripped my honor from me and removed the crown from my head. He, may, he breaks me down on every side and I am gone. He has uprooted my hope like a tree. He has also kindled his anger against me and considered me as his enemy. And to one of his friends, in the later verse, this is my last one, he says to one of his friends that's been spouting off, he says, why do you persecute me as God does? And you're not satisfied with my flesh. Lord, is that, am I not suffering enough here? <laughs> why do you persecute me like God is doing? Okay, what are you, when you hear all those, what are you thinking? What's a natural reaction? It's a natural reaction? When you're in that kind of pain? Yeah. You might lash out at somebody. Someone else spots it so? here? It reminds yeah. me of the miraculous nature of trusting God. The Bible tells us that it's a miracle for us to trust in Him. And when you're seeing it, as we've all suffered, we have those moments where we, we trust Him and we take comfort 
who knew Job in the situation in Texas, you would gain comfort in, I'm going to see my kid again. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping in Christ to consider Christ lest you grow mm -hmm. weary. Mm -hmm. And when there's that perspective of God is kind, God has a purpose for this, there's hope. Mm -hmm. But then I can't, and certainly Job can't grasp all of it once, exposure to all of God. No, wait, what? He made all this? Like, you know, you're not good. Yeah. And so I totally feel Job's. Yes. Yeah. I can't hold both of those areas. It's like the, the, flesh, the flesh and the spirit. Yeah. Of, like, no, that's not right. This is, yeah. this is, it's crushing, it's trashing. It, it, I can't buy God doing that. But then when you're in that place where you do believe Prophet's kindness, yep. it must be a miracle. Yep. Let's kind of go in a couple different directions. Yeah, so it's just great. consider Christ lest you grow weary. It's like, I can only consider so much of Christ. Yep. You can't consider his allowing sin, because that is not, uh, you know, it just doesn't urge me. So it's like, gosh, it's just me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well said, all that resonates. And and that's where I can't, you know, I can't get away from the that illustration, that idea that we've used a million times with the, the two sides of the board or the two circles of just you got these simultaneous realities. And part of what God is exposing here in Job's story, through really extreme measures, admittedly, extreme measures, is exposing what the human heart is like apart from a miraculous revelation, apart from a miraculous comfort, this is what comes out of us, is this kind of outrage, this kind of protest against our maker. It, 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 it is undeniably true. So that even if you see the best that man can get, and, and Don has referred to this as, you know, the Tom Brady of religious guys, the I think of the old Gillette commercial, the best a man can get, remember that, there's a little theme song. So even if you think of, in a sense, a righteous response with a lowercase sort of R, that, okay, yeah, there, there is a sort of righteousness about him in his, in his devotion to God and his former life and in his raising of his kids and his taking responsibility and his man of being of integrity. And there was some value to that on a horizontal level for certain. But when it comes to the essence of things, man, when, when enough of the, the suffering of creation comes in upon him and his Achilles heel is, is hit, now what comes out is the real heart of man which shakes its fist and says, how dare you? And we know that's what he was thinking because later when God is communicating with Job, he says, are you going to sit me down and accuse me of wrong? Are you going to be justified that I would be wrong? Like, are you going to condemn me, Job? This is almost like this legal argument in a way. Like, who is innocent and who is guilty here? And Job, you heard some of the things that I read. I mean, he's attributing, he's ascribing unseemliness, wrongness to his maker. And it doesn't, you know, for Jeff Pierce, it doesn't take much for that part of me to come out. Maybe it takes more for you than me. But whatever these pressures are, that part comes out that is maybe not explicitly, but it comes from this place of this is not right. This is not the way I would do things. This is not fair. This is not. And it's this rebellion against our maker. So that's the, the human natural side, and, and we feel it. And, and in Romans 8, that I'm going to talk about in the sermon, I mean, Paul, even when he says, oh, wretched man that I am, that's part of what he's describing is he's very aware, he's very much in touch with that fallen side of him, his flesh, and, and loathes it, but is stuck. And that's why he says, who will, what? Deliver me. Who, who's going to save me from this predicament? And not me. I can't. What am I even? This is what I got. And, and, and that's where, in a way, it's like God is teaching Job of the essence of true righteousness. Not just the human version of it. 
And so he has this, and we know how it goes. Again, we've, you guys, if, if anyone's familiar with Job, you guys who've been part of this conversation will be familiar with it. But, you know, you get to the end. And so Job's friends, they say their stuff. And, of course, they're largely unhelpful. And I love it. Years ago, I heard someone say, hey, Job's friends were fantastic counselors until they opened their mouths. Like, okay, hey, just be there, suffer. But to be starting to throw off your little platitudes and think not helpful, right? And especially when you're kind of doing it in a condescending way, when you're not the one whose soul has just been split in half. That's easy for you to say when you're not sitting in that place. And same thing again with people in Texas. Gosh, it's like, you know, shut shut our mouths here. Like until you're going through that, you, you don't have much you can say that would be helpful, right? So um, you get to the end. Friends have all said their piece. Job's argued with them. That's gone back and forth. More of his bitterness and anger that's understandable has come out. And then now God sits him down and begins to engage Job. And at that point, as God asks him a series of questions, it all goes back to God's sovereignty over all of creation and his plans and how, how vast the scope of God's control and the brilliance of God's design and the generosity of God's heart that gives and affords all these things. In that context, then, God says, okay, so now who's going to save you, Job? Who's going to save you from all that darkness that's come out of you? Who's going to save you, and you could say on some level, in, the, in this cursed creation? Who's going to save you on either level, the spiritual dark level, the creation, fragile, fallen level of, of, of the natural order of things? And then after God is like, basically schooled Job in a way that you would say, wow, it still seems really extreme and really harsh. And yet you see Job's response is when he has been running his mouth for a long time, now his response is in chapter 40, he says, Behold, I am insignificant. What can I reply to you? I laid my hand on my mouth. Where he basically just goes like this. <laughs> okay, I'm done. I'm done talking. Once I have spoken, even twice, and he says, I will add nothing more. Which is his way of saying, I'm done talking. Cover my mouth. I'm all ears now. So what, what do you attribute that to what is taking place? If Job has, in the beginning, he was, he was quiet and he restrained his lips and he didn't sin with his lips, and then chapter after chapter after chapter of him, just his accusations and his protests and just giving full vent to what he's really thinking. And now at the end, he says, oh, I'm done talking. So what's taking place? I think he's been persuaded. And he trusts and believes that God has given it. If you all the stuff you just talked about, then there must be the ability to bring you out of this situation. Yeah. He, you know, he's, it's like, so let me ask you this. So all those protests and, and his accusations toward God and, and his you could call it angry outbursts and, and all those accusations. That's kind of what's fueling it all. I mean, was Job capable of that before everything that unfolded, before all the tragedies took place? And most of you are nodding. Yeah, he was. Do you think, I mean, did he, do you think he understood, to what degree do you think he understood that about himself? At this point, or Patrick says, No way. Uh, yes, Sydney. So, um, before. before, before all the tragedies, before you know, again, his, his livestock, his material things, and his kids, and then his own body. So, well, you say, No way, more than anything else, was his own total ignorance, which God pointed out. Yeah, so part of what he's realizing after God has engaged him. 
and asked him a whole series of questions, right? Where were you when I created, and he goes through all these different created things and, and kind of uh, manifesting his power and creation is what he's talking about. And, and Job is now put in his place in a very real sense. And, and so did he understand really how small and how much of a recipient he was? Well, and I love how Adonis highlighted some of the passages where Job, remember he said things like, well, hey, I used to, you know, I used to go into the town square and everybody, yeah, right. He, he's like chest thumping. I go, you know, I'd go in and everybody was amazed. And everybody would ask me my opinion. And everybody would be fawning all over me for my great wisdom and integrity and everything else. And then, and then you took all that away from me. I mean, like the rest of us, he had an inflated view of his own importance. Even in his integrity, while there was a sense in which, humanly speaking, horizontally speaking, yes, he was a righteous man of integrity. However, underneath it was all this, um, I don't even want to call it pride, self-sufficiency, Amber Alert. We're all in sync here. Yeah. Pride, uh, self sufficiency, and even, I mean, true or false, true or false, Job attributed some of that blessing to, at least some of that blessing to his own deservedness, right? And that comes out when you look carefully at what he said. So, so all of that is manifest, the, the rebellion against God, the, the honest outcry of his heart, and then God communicates with him, puts him in a place, and puts him in his place in the, in the best possible way. And as, as this time has gone by, God teaching him and patiently teaching him, he brings Job to a place of, of covering his mouth and listening and and this idea that, hey, Job, you, because at one point God says, hey, you know, I, go ahead and save yourself then. Right. And, and part of this is getting him to a place to admit, hey, I, I can't save myself. And what was not crystal clear for Job at that time in history, but is crystal clear for us now that I absolutely have to mention, you know, run out of time here, is... You have, you have later coming, Jesus, who we could say is, is like the, the greater Job. Jesus, who, who manifests true righteousness, capital R, righteousness, who, who's, who living in this fallen world, suffering loss, not in the exact same way, but yet, you might as well say in the same way in that everything was taken from him. And it's fascinating, is it not, when, when Satan is, is come before God and at one point he says, hey, um, I should look at it so I don't butcher it. When he talks about touching Job's body, he says, skin for skin, all that a man has, he will give for his own life. So, okay, yeah, you took everything away, all his material things, even his own kids, and that's awful, terrible. But God, if you really want to see what he's made of, then touch his body. Because all the man has, he will give for his body. It's like, that's the last straw, man. And it's true that once that happens, now all the stuff just starts gushing. All the sin, all the rebellion starts gushing out of Job. So now go back to Christ, the greater Job, losing everything and including his own, the suffering and affliction of his own body. Not just in some natural way, but is literally victimized by evil men, physically tortured. And in all of that suffering, what comes out of Christ's heart is, is full righteousness, right? Never rebelling against his father, never accusatory, never protesting in the way that Job did. So... When God asked the question about salvation, you know, we have an answer that goes even deeper than 
than Job's answer at the time in terms of the clarity regarding God's redemptive plan to bring Jesus into this world and to rescue us through Christ. And that rescue is, is really the same. It's rescue from all that stuff within that fallen part of us that is rebellious and hostile, that is in, in, in great need in a fallen, cursed creation, in a fallen, cursed body, with even a fallen, cursed mind still remaining. The hope for salvation is the hope that only God can provide, that only God can bring to pass, and through Christ does. And, and we have an opportunity as we read Job, one, to reckon with, hey, this is what man is made of. And so again, go back to what happened in Texas. Any one of us would be, would be suffering and, and plagued by horror and grief at the same levels. And every one of us would be outraged and protesting even like we said, all the questions, okay, why did it happen? And why did the shooter get to that place in his mind? And why did his family not stop it? Why did the police stop it? I mean, all those questions. And at the bottom, it's like, why, God, did you allow this? That, that is an understandable question and even accusation from a creature to, a, to the creator. And by some miracle, the creator brings us to a place, his way, and his time, to a healing place of acceptance of our limited dependence and our being receivers of everything we have physically and even our, our need for and, and the blessing of receiving salvation of a heart that is quickened. And back to Dave, what you brought up earlier, the point of quickened to the point where we can even just see God for who he is and, and let go of the rage and have have worship take place where we say he is the giver of all good things and and as you see restoration at the end of Job's life this last thing I'll say and it kind of fits perfect some ways tease up our sermon for this morning but remember at the end of Job's life what happens so so Job deals with his friends he then goes back and forth with God he's put in his place he humbles himself and then God does what he blesses him doubly blessed and he gets all these you know more his family grows again and as Don has pointed out, it's very true. Even if you're that, if you're Job in that situation, you're still thinking, okay, but I don't get my original kids back. I don't get those other things. Nevertheless, you, you see that picture of abundance. You see that picture of restoration. You see that picture. Well, similarly for us, we, we do have, we don't have the promise of escape of this fallen world at this point, right now, right here, right now. Like that's a guarantee of let's put it this way, full healing or full restoration in the here and now, no, but in the future, yes. Like absolutely, the fullness of all things, the meek shall inherit the earth, uh, uh, there will be a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells, and there will be no more curse, and no more tears, and no more loss. So that that is all true. And, and, and in the meantime, in sort of the timeline of things, we find ourselves still creatures in a fallen creation, with a God who has mercy on us in this in this place. Um, okay, we need to stop um, over time, but let's uh, let's pray and, and give thanks for the lesson. And I hope it's meeting you on some level of where you've been thinking. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word that confronts us with truth that. In a very real sense, we wrestle with, and yet on a deep level, because of your grace toward us, and because of your spirit, we, we receive and know that we need it, and we, we experience it as healing. The truth was set free. You, you frame all things through your revelation so that we can make sense of the world we live in, the state we find ourselves in, even the wrestling that goes on within our own hearts and minds, you, you give us enough revelation to make some sense of that, even though we don't have all of our questions answered. And you do point us to Christ as the only hope, the, the righteous one, 
the submissive one, the loving one, the, the real hero, the redeemer, savior, who even offers us not only help and mercy in this life, but hope for the next and for resurrection. And so we thank you for that hope. Pray you'd help us miraculously to trust and cling to you, even as we are assured that you are holding on to us. So we thank you for the time we've had this discussion and pray for service. Help us, God, to receive more of your gospel truth, to be uplifted by it. In Jesus' name.